Good afternoon. Uh, we still have a, a, um, a train to catch. So this session, this particular segment will end at 5, and the ministers will uh, leave the stage. And then we'll have a conversation for 30 minutes with some experts who are joining us online. Uh, basically, they will, in many ways, challenge what the ministers have told us in the next 50 minutes. Hmm. So it will be an interesting um, panel. Uh, and the reason um, we are doing this is because we were told that Europe is peaceful and calm. You don't have too many troubles of your own. So we are bringing some of the politics of the Indo-Pacific to you, uh, just to make it a little more interesting. Uh, before I start, let me first thank uh, uh, Minister Loger and uh, uh, Peter Gark uh, for uh, partnering with us and giving us an opportunity to host this session at the Bled Security Forum. I think it's important to bring the flavor of India to the conversations here. And uh, I'm thrilled that uh, uh, we will also be hosting the Bled Security Forum panel in, at the Raisina Dialogue next year in India. So I hope uh, we will have more political uh, conversations, more um, economic uh, policy conversations, and hopefully uh, we will start working together for a common future. Now, in this regard, I think uh, most people would agree that the 21st century uh, sees the Indo-Pacific emerge as one of the key domains. Uh, I was reading an article last week which said that for the first time in 200 years, Asia's uh, PPP GDP is now bigger than the rest of the world. So after 200 years, the real economic wealth in that part of the world is greater than the rest of the world. And this, was, uh, this is something that, of course, brings with it uh, its own complications. Uh, I don't think Asian institutions necessarily are geared to manage this responsibility of being such a big economic behemoth. Uh, I think it's politically uh, uh, weaker in that sense when you look at Europe. And uh, also you see, uh, uh, alongside the economic growth, a rise of new politics, of, uh, uh, of loud politics, of expansive politics, um, and certainly uh, a challenge to some of the multilateral institutions, arrangements, and assumptions of the past. Indo-Pacific uh, epitomizes all of this. Uh, dynamic economics, uh, loud politics, and certainly an uncertain future. And to try and decipher all of this, to try and understand how can we partner together uh, to uh, work on putting together the undergirding that will define the Indo-Pacific in the future, we have a stellar panel with His Excellency Dr. Anjay Loga, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Slovenia. Thank you for joining us, sir. Uh, Ababu Nawamba, Chief Administrative Secretary, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Kenya. Uh, Dr. Augusto Santos Silva, uh, who till very recently was steering the EU effort uh, on the Indo-Pacific. He's the Foreign Affairs Minister of Portugal. And uh, uh, Dr. Subramaniam Jay Shankar, the Foreign Affairs Minister from India. So thank you for joining us for the ORF's inaugural um, uh, debut uh, at this particular forum. Uh, let me start with you, uh, Minister uh, Logar. Uh, how do you see um, the partnership going forward? We have seen certain progress made in the last six months, the Porto Summit, the India-EU Connectivity Partnership. We've seen greater political and economic depth uh, lent to this bilateral or to this group. Under your leadership, under the Slovenian leadership of the EU, what is your vision for uh, this particular relationship? Well, thank you very much. I'm, I'm really glad to host all those eminent guests here in Slovenia on a Blad Strategic Forum. Um, one, one, would, uh, one should compare discussion in the EU arena a few years ago and now, and, and, and would witness the dramatic change. Ten years ago, we did not speak about Indo-Pacific, enhanced cooperation with that. Now we are talking about I mean, Mr. Shankar will even participate in Gimnich meeting to talk about the importance of Indo-Pacific. And if something, for example, current involvement in situation in Afghanistan prove how important it is that European Union outreach and try to find a new partnership with the countries from the region. And as India represents the most numerous democracy in the world, I think it's a natural interlocutor within the region uh, in uh, incoming years and decades to come. So Slovenian presidency definitely is trying and is doing to put the issue high on the agenda. And I, we expect that 
this dialogue will strengthen and will get even more formal framework in incoming years. And I guess as well, the same vision is shared, at least my, um, uh, my opinion was after today's meeting with the Indian foreign minister that there is a wish from both sides to reapproachment and to more partnering cooperation in the future. Ask you a slightly uh, 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 important question that many of us sitting in India engage with. Uh, we see that uh, a lot of European countries, and certainly even Slovenia, uh, you are part of a 16 plus 1 initiative where um, China is an important partner. Uh, you are also the member of the European Union. Uh, the European Union sees China as a, as a strategic competitor. Uh, I, I think your predecessor uh, in, the, in the EU leadership had also mentioned it as a challenge. Uh, how do you square these two relationships up? Indo-Pacific, in some sense, and the way we engage with it is to, in a sense, manage the rights and manage the expansiveness of, of China. And yet here you have this very strong relationship. How do, you, how do you work with China on the one hand and partner with Australia, Japan, US, and India on the other hand? Well, well I, I don't walk, I talk. Um, you have two, in a way, superpower in the region with the two different systems, approximately uh, the same size of, I mean, uh, inhabitants. And uh, I guess as well, two way of thinking how to do business. And um, we all know how China is approaching and how they are dealing with their partners, with their competitors, and with our other superpower. Um, well, just to the previous session we had when a Greek foreign minister said that all thought that in relations with China, when China will develop, evolve, they will sooner or later acquire the way of thinking the democratic world is uh, acquiring. But apparently this proved wrong. They have different vision of, of how to, to deal and how to tackle more transactional approach in, in, in international fora. Well, I think there in, in, in the Indian case, it's, it's, it's slightly different. And here I, I would refer to the, I would quote one uh, sentence from the book of Mr. Yashankar, The Indian Way. When I, I find it very intriguing, very interesting. He said, India is better off being liked than just being respected. And I think that this sentence shows the essence of difference between China and India. Well, I'm an optimist, so I hope that this sentence definitely shows this difference. Uh, ask you one quick question. You had also said, uh, I'm persistent. I, I, I want something spicy coming out, but that's my Indian trait. Uh, uh, but let me ask you this. You had suggested that Port Copper, if I, if I get the name right, could be an access point for India, could be an access point for India in this particular region. How are talks progressing there uh, on that particular front? Have you uh, reached out to the Indians? Have you suggested that as a possible point of entry? Well, we opened this uh, discussion today at our ministerial meeting. We already talked this before. It was a plan uh, during my participation at the Racine uh, Forum, physical presentation to come with a delegation from Port Cooper, but unfortunately COVID situation postponed this issue. But you can be sure that from Slovenian side there is determination in order to continue in, in that sense, as we really see that here we can really uh, enhance our bilateral exchange. We look forward to hosting you at Raisina next year in person. Uh, uh, let me turn to Honorable uh, Nabamba, um, Chief Administrative Secretary, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Kenya. So sitting on the Western Indian Ocean, uh, a very important economy of the continent, how do you, how do you view the evolving dynamics of the Indo-Pacific? Is this an opportunity? that new actors are going to offer to the continent? Or is this a, a challenge and a threat to the system that is already in place? Um, the, the economies are booming in that continent before the pandemic. So do you think that it, it's a disturbance called uh, the politics and, and the new partnerships? Uh, thank you, Samia. Um, let me first of all thank Minister Loga for uh, inviting us here. Uh, to participate in this uh, 
16th uh, Bled Forum uh, on the future of Europe. And specifically, um, this particular conversation on partnerships for uh, in the India, Indo-Pacific. Uh, Kenya, of course, is the Indo-Pacific gateway to Africa. And therefore, uh, this is a conversation that is very relevant to our place um, in Africa, and specifically the Horn of Africa, Horn of Africa region. And it comes at such an appropriate time for us, uh, just a month before Kenya assumes the presidency of the UN Security Council. So very, very important conversation. Now, um, the Indo-Pacific, of course, is not, a, is not, a, it's not homogeneous. Mm -hmm. It is a very heterogeneous uh, uh, a belt, uh, a melting pot of peoples and cultures and interests. And you could, you could even look at it geo, geographically in terms of um, the Eastern Indo-Pacific, the uh, Central Indo-Pacific, and, uh, and the Western Indo-Pacific, where we fall. Um, and um, in terms of the evolving dynamics and opportunities we see and, and, and our view of what is happening currently, um, we see three important dynamics which, which are important for us. The first one is um, militarization. Uh, militarization uh, in the Red Sea, that is our immediate neighborhood, and other sports. Of course, we, we do look at this... Uh, increased militarization as a, as a source of tension and um, something which, if not well managed, if not well handled, could, could actually escalate into a threat. Um, the second one is uh, piracy and transnational crime. And uh, of course, uh, these two are issues that uh, pose a very real threat given the volume of trade that goes on in this increasingly significant uh, maritime uh, trade route. And the third issue of concern is uh, ocean pollution. Ocean pollution, and you, 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 you're looking at uh, dumping of toxic waste, you're looking at uh, um, emission of fumes by ships in the, in the, in the, in the, along the trade routes. So these, these are issues that require a keen attention and uh, you, could, you could look at them both in terms of um, uh, posing threats, mm -hmm. but also presenting an opportunity for countries within the Indo-Pacific region to engage, mm -hmm. to, seek, uh, to seek solutions too. Uh, but uh, perhaps more importantly is the opportunities that you see emerging in this region. And in, in this case, I want to focus on the recently, uh, uh, the recent uh, regional comprehensive economic partnership. Mm -hmm. That is a platform which we see as uh, presenting real opportunities for engagement, real opportunity for, for shared prosperity. Because if you look at that region, you are looking at um, some very interesting, uh, uh, very interesting statistics, um, which uh, if you allow me, um, I, I would wish to share, uh, to share quickly technology. Um, yes. So you're looking at um, the volume, the population, you're talking about a population of about 2.2 billion people. That's about 30% of um, the global population. The GDP uh, is over 26 trillion uh, US dollars. Again, in the region of about 30% of, of, of the whole global, uh, global wealth. And, and therefore, the um, uh, 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 platform provides an opportunity for countries in the, in the Indo-Pacific to engage. And from where we are seated, as Kenya and Africa, we definitely would want to take advantage of this, uh, of this platform to, 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 to engage. 
So you uh, would recognize that in uh, the Western Indo-Pacific, and certainly even in India, one of our most important um, requirements today is investments in infrastructure, connectivity, uh, and of course in uh, our industrialization processes. Now the India-EU connectivity partnership uh, that was announced uh, this year uh, seeks to reach out and work with other countries. And certainly the African continent and Kenya would be one of the major potential partners of the future for this India-EU partnership. Do you see this as something that is uh, going to add value to uh, the current um, arrangements that you have? And I'm, uh, I'm talking about the Belt and Road Initiative. There is a certain degree of pushback in certain countries because it has been termed as debt trap diplomacy. It has been termed as perverse arrangements. Do you see this kind of new partnership actually offer you greater agency and options going ahead? Uh, how do you assess the potential of this recent announcement? Um, first of all, let me make it clear that Kenya is a believer in multilateralism. Uh, we believe in a uh, collegiate approach to issues. We believe in partnerships. And um, the EU-India uh, partnership is definitely significant. And it, 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 it does present uh, opportunity for, 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 for further engagement. But let me also say that uh, uh, at the moment, there haven't been any specific uh, initiatives from this partnership mm -hmm. jointly. Mm -hmm. Of course, I'm aware that uh, both India and the EU have significant portfolios in Africa, across Africa, but in their own respective uh, sense. And so it would be interesting for us to see um, what joint efforts uh, can emerge or can, um, can grow out of these very specific uh, Euro um, or EU-India uh, uh, relationship? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, and how do you view the Quad, uh, Mr. Secretary? Uh, is that, uh, you know, Quad has a number of arrangements they have announced uh, around uh, uh, some important issues around health, vaccines, uh, certainly supply chains. How do you see Quad as an actor uh, for the Western uh, Indo-Pacific, where you are sitting? It is an important, uh, it's an important uh, development. Um, you had also mentioned the, the, road, the, the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, the Chinese initiative. Um, in the context of both the Quad and uh, initiatives by China, like the Belt and Road Initiative, the position we hold is that um, Africa is uh, ready to engage and engage in a manner that is win-win. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think it would be useful to pose a question that would lead to making a choice so that one has to make a choice of whether to engage with China uh, on one hand uh, or engage with um, EU India, on the other hand. Um, the position is that we can, we can engage in a manner that is mutually beneficial for a win-win um, uh, result for, for, for all parties involved. And um, what Africa is looking for is opportunity for more trade, more investment, um, uh, shared prosperity. Mm -hmm. and, and let me make it clear that we believe there is space there is opportunity sufficient for everyone. Mm -hmm. What is not there certainly is uh, space and opportunity for our greed. But if it's about space and opportunity for shared prosperity, that is sufficient for everyone. Fair enough. Yes. The Accord as well as the India-EU partnership give you more options, choices, and opportunities. Absolutely. Uh, mm -hmm. Minister Silva, let me come to you. You have been in some ways the architect of uh, the new momentum that has uh, characterized the India-EU partnership. Let, let me first uh, take you back to the broader question of the liberal order. Uh, how important is the politics of the Indo-Pacific uh, for the liberal order? And is the uh, EU willing to be a political actor uh, to, in many ways, ensure that this political arrangement li remains liberal? I do think that uh, one of the main objectives 
of um, the strategy the European Union is uh, preparing for the Indo-Pacific is exactly to reinforce our partnership with those countries in the region that uh, share with us the same uh, adherence to the liberal order model. It means, very practically, to reinforce our relations with Japan, with Korea, South Korea, of course, uh, with Australia and New Zealand, and specifically with India. Um, the, 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 the sentence, uh, EU and India are the largest uh, democracies of the world, is not only um, a matter of fact, is a matter of policy, a matter of strategy. So it was very important, the leaders' meeting between uh, all the European leaders and Prime Minister Modi uh, last May, in order that uh, it established a new momentum for regular interaction between uh, these two large uh, democracies. And of course, when uh, we speak of uh, Indo-Pacific, we don't want to ignore other actors, but we want to multiply our interlocutors in the region, and spe especially those with whom we share this uh, liberal uh, democracy uh, model. And more, additionally, we want to cooperate more with them in uh, three complementary fields. The first one is to <clears throat> defend our security interests. For instance, the freedom of navigation in uh, uh, that region is a key uh, security interest for Europe as for the, uh, the stakeholders in, the, in that region. Uh, secondly, we uh, want to have these partners in our side in the geostrategic and geoeconomic competition that we are having in that region. That's why the partnership for connectivity between the European Union and uh, uh, India that was uh, signed in uh, Porto is so important to develop um, other, um, to, to improve the connectivity, meaning uh, the connectivity in terms of human mobility, in terms of digital communications, and in terms of transport infrastructures, and so on. And finally, last but not least, because we have in those uh, countries partners to cooperate with other regions in the world, namely with East, Eastern Africa. So it is very important and it, it is one of the main aspects of the Porto uh, political declaration between the two entities, European Union and India, this uh, commitment of both entities to cooperate more between them in terms of mutual cooperation with third parties in, uh, in Africa. So uh, you are perf perfectly right. There is a political uh, objective, there is a political uh, goal and a political rationale in, uh, this, um, transfer in, in this wording of our relation to that region in terms of uh, European strategy for the Indo-Pacific uh, region. And the word Indo, uh, related to India is crucial for the definition of that strategy. Mr. Minister, we have seen the deployment of the word values of uh, defending the liberal order used quite liberally uh, all across the world. What do you think Afghanistan does to the credibility of that uh, uh, project? You know, when you see images coming out of Afghanistan of, of pain, of suffering, of desertion, of betrayal, uh, how sellable is this concept of building a liberal world which is value-based? How do you sell the Atlantic uh, vision of the past to the Indo-Pacific vision of the future uh, of that being liberal? Well, uh, we have lessons to learn from our own experience, and uh, by 6 o'clock we will begin a very important and, uh, I'm, I guess, difficult discussion among the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the European Union exactly on this and on the latest experience in Afghanistan. But I would suggest that uh, the best way to deal with this is to, um, to renounce, to uh, phrase this approach as an Atlantic view. Why the liberal order is an Atlantic view? Why is not an Indian view institutionally? 
the, the values and the institutions of, uh, of India as a political society uh, are um, aligned with uh, the classical values, principles, and uh, protocols of uh, liberal uh, democracy. So uh, it's not a, a, an issue of uh, Europeans and North Americans trying to impose to the others their own values. It's a, a common commitment of all humanity to the Declaration of uh, Human Rights, which was approved in the United Nations, and it is not uh, Western uh, imposition, um, and it is um, a matter of uh, improving our relations and our cooperation with uh, societies in all parts of the world that share with us the same uh, principles uh, and that are also uh, committed to defend by means of cooperation their interests uh, in terms of security. Mr. Minister, um, we are nine months into this year, we are in September now. What do you think has been the big development in the India-EU relationship? And what do you think should be perhaps some important next steps we must immediately work on? Well, um, we, um, we achieved um, the, the fact that uh, there was a meeting at the highest level is uh, per se a good result. But it is, it is only the... Uh, overture. <laughs> it is only the opening of a very important, difficult, complex, but necessary track of bilateral negotiations. And the agenda was designed. We assumed uh, the commitment to resume the economic negotiations that were suspended in uh, 2013, aiming at uh, getting a um, uh, comprehensive trade agreement, uh, an agreement on the protection of geographical indications, and an agreement on uh, the protection of investment. So, uh, one very important track for bilateral negotiations is the economic uh, domain. Uh, secondly, we signed um, a partnership for connectivity, which is very demanding in practical terms, because uh, its aim, as I, I have already said, is to promote um, the, the, the relations of um, India and the European Union in terms of infrastructures, communications, and human mobility. We are doing, for instance, at the national level, for instance, Portugal and India are about to conclude an agreement on uh, human mobility, but we have to do it to scale up and to do it in terms of uh, uh, European Union. We, as Europeans, we have always to keep in mind that we, all of us, represent one-third of Indians. So <laughs> it's better to scale up our cooperation uh, in order to, to have a, a very important um, um, uh, field of uh, interaction with uh, this uh, quasi-continental uh, country. So I think we have uh, ahead of us a very complex, practical, but necessary negotiations. And now it's time, for instance, for the European Commission to work in order to propose our own uh, uh, objectives to the Indian counterpart. So I would say that uh, the, the main result of the Porto uh, meeting, the, the leaders uh, meeting, was the opening of a process. We didn't solve anything. We opened a very important window of uh, opportunity of cooperation. Uh, let me turn to the Indian Foreign Minister, Dr. Jay Shankar. Uh, and let me again go back to the book that Minister Lugar invoked, uh, The India Way. Uh, in The India Way, you have stated that part of India's foreign policy strategy would involve cultivating Europe. Could you shed some light on what that phrase means and how exactly does EU fit into India's vision and strategy today? First lesson, when you write a book, be prepared for people to throw it back at you. I hadn't, uh, I learned something in the process. Uh, but look, uh, seriously, uh, the reason I mentioned that was uh, for a long time, Indian diplomacy was focused on the larger European national states, okay? And there's nothing wrong with them. I mean, most of them have been good time-tested partners of ours. 
I think the fact that Europe had evolved so much was not necessarily reflected in our way of working. And I say that as self-criticism. I mean, I'm, I'm equally uh, to blame for this. So one of the first things I did when I became foreign minister was uh, actually to visit Brussels. And I tried to make it a point to actually make sure uh, that uh, we engage all the 27 EU members, which is why I'm particularly happy to be in uh, uh, Slovenia today. Uh, because we do realize Europe is a collective enterprise and you need in a collective enterprise to kind of uh, have all the stakeholders uh, with you as, part of, uh, as much as possible. Now, why should we cultivate Europe collectively? In a way, the answer was given by my Portuguese colleague, which is there are a lot of things in the world which are uh, not necessarily Western in the way in which people tend to see it or people tend to portray it. Uh, I think today when you speak about a liberal order, uh, when we speak about uh, trust and transparency, uh, I, I think these are issues which at one time may have been more central to a Western discourse, but are today increasingly shared beyond the Western world. Uh, and uh, I do see a lot of issues where uh, India and Europe uh, have meeting points, and it's important to come to Europe, engage your European counterparts, uh, discuss it with them. Uh, and one of them is actually, where does Europe stand vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Asia and the Indo-Pacific? Because uh, I would argue that especially after 2008, for reasons which we all know, uh, Europe has been much more reticent uh, about uh, articulating its interests and backing that up uh, beyond its immediate uh, confines. Uh, and in a globalized world, uh, that is not even in Europe's own interest. Uh, so uh, Europe needs to know that it has friends in Asia, uh, in the Indo-Pacific, uh, that a lot of uh, uh, principles and values uh, uh, and outlook that Europe has, a lot of other countries share it. Uh, I think that uh, binary you know, Western, non-Western is a false binary. Uh, I think it's a very self-serving binary. Uh, and I think by uh, strengthening India-EU relations, we, we refute it very convincingly. You have also spoken in the past of um, the few sectors where there is uh, imminent um, opportunity for both sides. You mentioned climate change as being, uh, or climate response as being one of them, digitalization as being another one. How do you reconcile uh, the differences within the EU in terms of uh, the way they want to move their technology decisions. Uh, there is the overbearing presence of a large actor who is not necessarily uh, trustworthy or transparent in many of the activities. How, do, how does India reconcile this digital bridge with the EU when EU itself seems to have big differences within in terms of uh, the choices they make in the technology regimes? Look, uh I mean, it's not India's responsibility or India's capability to solve mm -hmm. EU's problems. That's for EU to solve. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is natural if there are 27 countries in a collective, you will have a spectrum of uh, views and interests. So there will be a European debate, like there will be an African debate or like there will be a South Asian debate or there will be an Indo-Pacific debate. Uh, I think what is uh, important for us is whether the, the net result of that is an outcome which, with which uh, India is comfortable as a basis uh, of a partnership. And uh, today, if you look, I don't want to say a post-COVID world because we are still very much in a COVID world. What has the COVID world done? COVID world has raised fundamental issues whether the current globalization model is the right model. Uh, the word strategic autonomy, which used to be heard politically in India, decades ago is today heard in Europe, economically. Okay. Today, issues of trust and transparency, uh, reliable and resilient supply chains. I mean, these are the terms which the COVID world uh, has spawned. And I think it's important uh, in a world where all of us uh, have expanded our uh, perception of national security to cover something more than you know, a kind of a military, political, physical, you know, uh, intelligence security, to a, a larger sense of well-being, vulnerability, uh, 
in this world, I, I think societies who are, uh, in a sense, democratic, who are market-based, who are open, uh, who, who may have their own debates, and we, we, we may not always agree. Uh, I do think that there is a kind of a, a new basis for conversations which are coming out uh, in a COVID world. Uh, I mean, today you are, you are pointing at India and EU, but I think it applies equally uh, to India and Africa and presumably to Europe and Africa as well. Dr. Jayshankar, uh, you alluded to Fortress Europe after 2008, where in many ways, while they uh, embraced economic globalization, they were reticent to engage politically with the world. Uh, do you sense a shift? You see lots of boats floating from Europe to the Indo-Pacific. You see the uh, UK send its uh, fleet. You see uh, Germany make a trip. You see other uh, announcements. Uh, the France, French, of course, are uh, uh, active and, and ambitious in that region. Do you think this is a new political moment for EU, or is it too early to make that reach that conclusion? Well, I mean, there are certainly, as you said, a lot of boats moving. Uh, but I, you know, I, I think that I wouldn't reduce the debate to that, you know, and I am not disrespecting your remark. Uh, I would certainly sense that there is a, a sharper awareness in Europe today that what happens in Indo-Pacific, what happens in Asia, what happens in Africa, what happens in the Middle East, impinges directly on the interests of Europe. I think that realization is sharper in 2021, let us say, than 2014. Uh, and because of that, I think there's a much greater interest in Europe uh, uh, to deal with other regions, especially a region uh, like the Indo-Pacific. And some of that interest, for example, we saw reflected in the EU 27 uh, summit with India uh, on May 8th. My own sense is, this is good for the world because, you know, what, I mean, if you, if you look at the evolution of the world order since 1945, there's been new centers of production, there's new centers of consumption. Uh, if you look at the top 20, 30 economies, the interse list has changed. Uh, I think the big development, which in my view, all of us have a collective interest, is actually in the more faster rise of Africa because only then the world will truly become multipolar in my view. But I would say if all of us took more interest in each other's lives, I suspect as a collective we would be better off. Uh, and, and maybe just as a quick question, uh, how do you see the going ons in Afghanistan impact this project, uh, this common project of defending, creating a rules-based liberal order? They gave you a very neat answer by saying that they're going to discuss it at six. I'll discuss it with them after six. <laughs> Fair enough. Minister Logar, uh, uh, let me uh, turn to you. Uh, uh, I, I was able to attend some of uh, the conversations and I heard some of the reportage coming out of this particular forum. Uh, what is very clear is that, like uh, within uh, the country I come from, there are internal divergences on, on some key questions. Uh, and uh, you don't hold back like we don't hold back. I think they are quite... Uh, uh, public uh, differences on uh, uh, on investments, difference on on uh, also the nature of political regimes. Uh, my question to you is that when you have a very vibrant and divergent internal system within the EU, would you be comfortable on creating common positions on some really difficult questions that the Indo-Pacific is posing? For example the development of South, Chi South China Sea, for example, on Taiwan or Hong Kong, for example, uh, in the Himalayas. Do you think that the EU, as a political actor, and that's what uh, Dr. Jay Shankar was suggesting, EU as a political actor, can it reach that degree of consensus to take a position on some of these difficult questions? Well, Europe is um, in a system that it's sui generis and it has its own goods and bad things. So there are 27 member states and in some area we have, uh, let's say, communitarian system and some system we are working and performing like independent state. Well, in foreign and security policy there is uh, unanimity required, which means that um, 
Sometimes it's a bottleneck to adopt a bold decision on uh, regarding, let's say, inter international relation. And as you know, it's a high representative that it represent a foreign policy of the European Union upon agreement of member states. So uh, the architecture as is it now, I think it's uh, giving, let's say, un united uh, statement for broad issue, but those very sensitive issues are more or less uh, left aside for the member state today on their own. And I think it's, o it's okay, it's good for that, because otherwise it becomes too uh, uniform uh, approach. Uh, however, as long as we are tackling human rights issues, so let's say the ideas of the founding principle of the European Union, as I remember, we always succeeded to have bold decision. We were, we succeeded to adopt new sanctions. We succeeded to adopt other measures that was, you know, uh, on the arsenal of European Union available in a toolbox for, let's say, force with, the, in a way, not so soft but not so strong for our other interlocutors into the direction we think it's right. Mr. Silva, can I ask you the same question? Same question? The same question. Uh, do you think there is a um, need today to mobilize a political consensus to be a real actor in some of these tough... It's a tough neighborhood in the past. <clears throat> yes, I do think that um, consensus and uh, <clears throat> its consequence, the unanimity uh, rule, is uh, <clears throat> a factor that can uh, enforce European positions. When we agree at 27, we have uh, a legitimacy and we have a capacity that uh, none of us could have if uh, it acted individually. But this, has, uh, uh, this is a coin with the two faces, and the other face is, uh, of the coin is that uh, we have morally and politically, each of us, the duty to contribute to a consensus. Uh, sometimes Portugal, it is the case of Slovenia and other, many other member states, we have to, um, to, to have an evolution in our position in order to uh, approach the consensus in order that the unanimity is possible. And unfortunately, uh, currently one or two or even three member states are not accepting this political responsibility. So we, uh, we face some cases, fortunately they are uh, quite few, but sometimes in important issues in which we cannot approve a declaration of the European Union as such because one of the member states is, uh, is vetting it, uh, vetting it. And uh, this is not the idea of uh, founding our external policy and security policy on a consensus, a very strong one, but it has this uh, assumption that everyone can uh, um, contribute to that consensus. Uh, and uh, the, the, the veto should be exercised only in... Uh, in issues that could uh, put in question national fundamental interests. So perhaps this is already a debate that we are uh, having uh, internally, and I think this uh, debate will uh, be very important, very tough, but it is very necessary. If not, what we are doing is uh, what we call the enhanced corporations. It means that groups of member states um, go into a uh, direction more deeply or more rapidly than uh, the, the organization uh, uh, as such. Uh, and, and is that um, a, a real danger? Is that a danger that you would see some breakout groups uh, putting together more muscle and weight behind certain issues? Um, theoretically and uh, politically, I do think that um, uh, Europe is a mosaic. Mm -hmm. a very different countries with different traditions, languages, histories, and uh, 
um, and uh, even ways of living. And uh, this is a strength of uh, Europe. This is a, um, a richness of uh, Europe being this uh, mosaic. Uh, but um, uh, in the next future, we will see uh, what we call the um, variable geometry. We will see that uh, we shall have uh, a common ground in terms of, in of internal markets, of course, of uh, values, common values and uh, institutions, and in terms of uh, uh, some very general approaches. And we are going to see different formations of states within the European Union. Some of them uh, uh, share the same currency, as uh, it happens in the Eurozone. Some of them uh, uh, have uh, the, what we call the structured cooperation. It means uh, more improved cooperation in terms of defense and security, and others forming other groups uh, in other fields of uh, cooperation. So I do think that uh, um, not in uh, this uh, mandate, but um, somehow and uh, and um, uh, in the next uh, decades to come, Europe will uh, see this uh, evolution in terms of uh, m what we call multiple speeds in our European integration. Minister Lova, you want to come? Yeah, I wanted just to add the fact that I mean talking about. Um, keeping the unanimity in foreign policy of EU foreign policy or, let's say, bring it away in order to be more um, concrete in a statement on, a, on, a, on a foreign, uh, foreign relations. It's constantly uh, moving around ministers and other uh, decision makers and the institutions as well are talking about, European Parliament is regularly talking about even we both, during our last visit, uh, discussed about this. And Augusto had a very good argument in that sense that um, in order to prevent going to qualified majority in, in, in foreign policy, in foreign relations, is and preserve unanimity is not to abuse unanimity for your own political goal. So abusing it is the strongest argument against not keeping the unanimity. And I think this really nicely represents the you know, broad thinking. Mr. Navamba, uh, the last two years have actually uh, shown a torch on the international system. Uh, we have uh, looked at um, issues around vaccine inequi inequity. We have seen countries struggling to access uh, drugs, pharmaceuticals, and, and health services. Uh, more recently, we have seen uh, certain pol political upheavals in different parts of the world. S sitting in Kenya, how do you assess uh, the performance of the international system uh, in some of these critical questions around <coughs> development issues, health issues, political and security questions? Uh, and are you optimistic uh, about this new uh, uh, you know, political geog uh, geography called the Indo-Pacific that is emerging? Do you think that this offers us a chance to reset and restart, or do you think we are going to see some tougher times ahead? Uh, recent developments, of course, have definitely put a strain on um, uh, the established regional multilateral systems. Um, and their ability to deliver. Um, and, and, and the COVID-19 pandemic has especially brought to the fore uh, some of the challenges that um, remain very alive in, in our Mideast. Take the challenge of um, um, and, and hindered or free access to, to vaccines, for instance. Um, which, which has really demonstrated the inequalities that still exist. Uh, and sometimes we forget when faced with uh, an existential threat such as the COVID-19 pandemic, we forget that um, um, limitation in any part of the world is actually a risk to the whole world. Um, 
and therefore it is a lesson is a lesson to the world that we need to do more together uh, and we need to strengthen the systems we have put in place to deliver on some of these promises. Now, do we have um, faith in the evolving uh, architecture, if I would call that architecture of the Indo-Pacific, uh, to be maybe to be a platform to provide answers to some of these challenges? Uh, I would say certainly yes. Um, I said at the beginning that uh, this is um, an area of uh, an amazing constellation of uh, diversity in terms of cultures, peoples, countries at different levels of uh, development, yet there is also a very strong um, shared history and uh, certain values that are, if uh, given prominence, can, can, can bring this region together in a very strong way. And, and certainly, therefore, we see the emerging cooperation around the Indo-Pacific as, as, as a good opportunity. Uh, and that is why, as Kenya, as Africa, we definitely want to play a prominent role and ensure that we achieve um, the, the aims of, 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 this, of this agenda. And, and specifically, there are certain things that we'd want to see happen uh, quickly. Some of the measures that we are putting in place in Africa, for instance, uh, I'll mention in this regard, the Africa technology, um, the Africa um, Maritime Technology Cooperation Center, mm -hmm. which is located in Mombasa, Kenya. It's an important platform mm -hmm. for uh, working on the question of maritime security and some of the challenges that I mentioned earlier, uh, ocean pollution. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we can build partnership around institutions such as that to deliver solutions that uh, we know that if solved can unleash incredible growth in areas like the blue economy, for instance. Um, Kenya has also put in place recently uh, a coast guard, a coast guard as part of efforts to strengthen the whole agenda of maritime security, uh, to deal with the challenge of piracy and transnational crime. Uh, these are areas of cooperation. I know we are already doing a lot with the European Union. We are already doing a lot with India. And, and all these present an opportunity definitely for us to do more together for the shared prosperity of this whole region and the world. Dr. Jayashankar, let me uh, come to you as we close this uh, first segment, the one-hour segment uh, with the uh, ministers. Um, end of the day, any partnership, any arrangement, any coalition is judged by its performance. Uh, what do you think are the key deliverables that this partnership, this collective has to produce, uh, has to deliver to uh, countries and regions and communities uh, to be counted? Uh, otherwise, it's just a, a, a talk shop and a panel discussion. Which partnership? India-EU? India-EU partnership, specifically. Partnership has, uh, partnership has uh, definitely economic deliverables. I think it has a connectivity deliverable. Uh, certainly, it has a values and outlook deliverable. It has a political deliverable. Uh, I mean, uh, I think right now everybody is a little cautious laying out positions on Afghanistan, but I think on issues like that, uh, there will be, you know, uh, there will be consultations and there will be uh, sort of positions which people would try to develop, if not in common, at least in some kind of coordinated uh, form. Because at the end of the day, uh, all of us have visions of the world uh, which reflect our values at home. Uh, I think those where, which converge more will tend naturally to gravitate to each other uh, and to work with each other. So uh, I do think, you know, that uh, this relationship will have milestones as it keeps unfolding, which you can say, okay, this set of, the, on this issue, these decisions came out of India-EU uh, confabulations. So I think uh, that's a, a good segue to close this particular segment. There are economic deliverables, there are political deliverables, and then there are value deliverables that the India-EU partnership, especially in the, in the Indo-Pacific context, must be appraised through. 
And um, let me thank the ministers. Please join me in applauding their interventions this afternoon. And thank all of you for joining us. I can request the ministers to um, uh, leave the stage and continue with their schedules and programs. And we will move to the next segment, where we will be joined by um, experts and practitioners, uh, Ambassador Kesha, Ms. Chakarova, and Dr. Twining. So ministers, please. Are we connected to our next set of speakers? Okay. And can I request you all to settle down? Uh, so, uh, welcome back to the second uh, segment of this conversation on partnerships for a rules-based order in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, we are joined by Ambassador Atul Keshav, uh, America's top diplomat to uh, India, someone who has uh, intimate knowledge of the region and indeed of the politics of the region. Uh, we have uh, Ms. Belina Chakarova, director of the Australian Institute for European and Security Policy, and she has been uh, following many of the political developments in Europe and indeed in the Indo-Pacific. And uh, joining them is Dr. Daniel Twining, president of the International Republican Institute. And we are in some ways going to continue the conversation we started with the ministers uh, and uh, in many ways ask them to share their perspectives. Let me quickly get into this conversation uh, by first uh, uh, posing my question to Ambassador Keshav. Uh, Ambassador Keshav, welcome to the forum. Uh, you have had a front row seat to the evolving competition that is now unfolding in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, I would like to know from you an American perspective on this region, on the role of actors such as India and the EU. And of course, perhaps um, you could also comment on uh, what does Afghanistan do to America's commitment to this uh, political project? Uh, 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 does it strengthen the resolve? Does it damage the image? Uh, let me turn to you, Ambassador Keshav. Ambassador Keshav, you might have to unmute yourself. Okay. So, uh, uh, Ambassador Keshav, you'll have to just give us a second. Uh, we are sorting some issues at our end. Many apologies. Um,
Should I go? Uh, Ambassador Keshav, do you want to try again? No, I think we are struggling. I don't think we are connecting. Okay, one more minute, sorry. Uh, can you try again, Ambassador Kesha? Yes. Yes. It's working. Yeah, we can Test. hear you. We can hear you now. So you can restart your reply, Ambassador Kesha. Yeah. Thanks, Samir. Um, I think uh, it needed a remote uh, unlock over there. Anyway, look. Let me first of all say what a delight it was to see you uh, host the previous uh, session. Uh, very informative as always. And huge thanks to our friends in Slovenia for bringing us all together. Great to see Dan and Belina, very happy to be on this uh, panel with them. And you've asked a great question. So uh, number one, what something that's extremely obvious is that the Indo-Pacific is of compelling importance for the United States and always has been and always will be. Uh, we've always been an Indo-Pacific power. We established a consulate in Calcutta in 1794. So we knew exactly where the Indo-Pacific was going back to the very earliest days of our republic. And we have remained an Indo-Pacific power throughout, and we intend to remain an Indo-Pacific power. Uh, what we welcome uh, entirely is Europe's increasing attention on the Indo-Pacific, and of course, India's abiding interest in the Indo-Pacific. We welcome partners who recognize the region's importance to global economic prosperity, strengthening the democratic order, and maintaining a stable, rules-based international framework. I'll talk a little bit about what Secretary of State Blinken said he talked about the centrality of the Indo-Pacific and its role in global geopolitics in a joint opinion piece that he issued with Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin in the Washington Post earlier this year, where he said, and I'll quote, the Indo-Pacific region is increasingly the center of global geopolitics. It is home to billions of the world's people, several established and rising powers, and five of America's treaty allies, plus a great deal of the world's trade travels through its sea lanes. Uh, I've heard from you, and I won't have to reiterate it, but the region accounts for over half the world's population and increasingly more and more of the world's GDP. It is also home to some of the world's largest militaries. Our feeling, our very strong feeling, is that all sovereign nations will prosper through the respect for freedom of commerce, a rules-based international order, and the peaceful resolution of disputes in accordance with international law. The U.S. vision for the Indo-Pacific is based on a responsibility to promote peace and prosperity in the region and drive sustainable growth and development. We believe that a free, open, and prosperous Indo-Pacific is a national priority for the United States, and we need to be active in the region to address both new and traditional threats. Obviously, we could talk about those threats, but I would say that with regard to European activity, uh, I was very privileged to join Deputy Secretary of State Wendy Sherman in Brussels back in June. We had superb conversations with our European friends, and we're greatly encouraged by the amount of attention uh, being made by various countries in Europe and by the EU writ large uh, to looking at uh, their outlook on the Indo-Pacific and their policies toward this very important region. We're seeing more and more activity uh, by Europe in the region, including uh, military deployments, and we welcome that as a good thing because we believe that our European friends and allies and democratic partners uphold the same values that we do, just like uh, India upholds the same values. I was at a, uh, a banquet that uh, Indian Chief of Defense Staff General Bipin Rawat hosted for Indo-Pacific uh, Commander uh, John Aquilino, Admiral John Aquilino. And uh, at the end of uh, our Indian colleague's uh, toast, I said, General, we, you know, we could have written those remarks. We are talking about the exact same things. We offer the same mantras and the same shlokas about how we view the Indo-Pacific and how we view India's role and our role. And frankly, I think all democracies share the same perspective because we all believe in a rules-based international order. So I think it's important that we all work together. We all work in coordination. We find ways to be complementary toward each other. And we're going to continue to engage with India both bilaterally as a trusted partner and natural ally and also as part of the Quad, which has been a, a project long coming but uh, intensifying uh, more and more. 
And we absolutely welcome a greater role by Europe in the Indo-Pacific. I can't speak for our Indian friends. They can speak for themselves on this. But from the U.S. perspective, uh, it's great to see the Queen Elizabeth uh, in Guam or sailing through the South China Sea or working uh, with us in the Indian Ocean. That is exactly the kind of energy and activity we want. It's great to see the French, who always remind us that they are a three-ocean power uh, and have population in three different oceans and military presence in three different oceans. The French bring great values, true of so many of our European friends. So, uh, you know, we have a long history of working with Europe in close coordination, especially through on transatlantic issues. And we welcome the opportunity to intensify and deepen that coordination uh, across the vast uh, Indo-Pacific. And um, you asked about Afghanistan, uh, Samir. Look, I don't do Afghanistan. I work on advancing the U.S.-India bilateral partnership. But I will tell you uh, that if you look at uh, any of our long-term partnerships and friendships across the Indo-Pacific, those have lasted for decades and decades. And we are an abiding and reliable partner uh, to Japan, to Korea, to Australia, to New Zealand, and to many others. And we have rapidly evolving relationships all across the region. And so I think you, you, you can, I hope, appreciate that the U.S. Uh, certainly stands by its strategic commitments and uh, makes the best decisions that it can uh, in order to telegraph its values around the region and help ensure prosperity and stability, not just for itself, but for all of its friends. Over. Thank you, uh, Ambassador. Uh, can I go to you, Belina? You've been um, studying China and Russia quite closely. In fact, you have coined a geopolitical term, dragon bear. Uh, now, if you were sitting either in Moscow or Beijing, and you were seeing these images come out of Afghanistan, uh, what would you be thinking today? And more broadly, uh, how do you think uh, Moscow and Beijing view the Indo-Pacific partnerships that are emerging, be it the EU and India, be it the Quad, uh, be it even uh, our, our, our partners in uh, uh, Africa? How do you, what is, what is your assessment of what's happening here? Mm -hmm. So thank you, Samir, for uh, the invitation and congratulations uh, to an excellent uh, panel uh, and, of course, uh, an excellent Blatt Strategic Forum. Now, I will skip the schadenfreude and I will move directly to the more pragmatic uh, long-term repercussions. Now, although there is not yet an open ideological competition, as we all know, the U.S., and Western-led liberal international order is in fact already threatened by the growing influence of China and Russia. So this dragon bear that I coined in 2015 to point to a dangerous systemic coordination between these two actors in key domains and fields is actually operating within the existing global order with a clear goal of disrupting it, dismantling its multilateral structures, and creating better conditions for its own notion of multilateralism, which is strictly opposed to Western norms, values, and rules of the game. So coordinated efforts by China and Russia in the UN Security Council, for instance, regarding Syria, Iran, and now we, we've seen already Afghanistan, but also other international and regional organizations will continue to grow as both states seek to improve their international image as norm setters in a rapidly changing uh, geopolitical um, global order. So all relevant actors, now the dragon bear on the one side, but also uh, the United States, the European Union, and other regional actors are in fact interested in integrating South and Central Asia through various connectivity, transportation, trade corridors. We've heard a lot about it from the panel discussion. At the same time, they are already competing for influence um, in implementing major energy, infrastructure, transport, and connectivity projects. Uh, and that is definitely going to be the case in Afghanistan. So what it means is that Beijing and Moscow are already preparing, and they have been preparing prior to the 
to the, to the U.S. troops withdrawal to fill the void um, in Afghanistan. However, the approach will be a different one. Beijing is unlikely to make the same mistakes uh, in this regard as the U.S. and the former Soviet Union uh, did. Mm -hmm. So rather than fighting against the Taliban or antagonizing them, Beijing is more likely to accommodate them in order to leverage the country's resources and facilitate the necessary networks within the BRI, the Belt and Road Initiative, but also the China-Pakistan-Afghanistan Economic Corridor. So they see Afghanistan as a major geopolitical uh, puzzle piece uh, of a bigger game, and that would be to connect Afghanistan, pa Pakistan, Iran, and then, of course, move towards Asia, uh, from Asia towards Africa, and, of course, Europe. And that also means, uh, in the long term, um, access to the Indian Ocean, uh, power projection in the Indian Ocean, and um, that is something to uh, be carefully observed um, post U.S. Mm -hmm. withdrawal from Afghanistan. So, following this withdrawal, uh, multilateralism, in my view, is becoming a kind of a buzzword as Western institutions, but also the Western understanding of multilateralism, uh, is becoming more or less a playground not only for diplomatic, but also for geopolitical, realpolitik battles between competing, pow competing powers, which is a similar uh, case as what we've observed during the Cold War era. And mm -hmm. here, the most important part is, of course, a systemic rivalry between the United States and uh, China. And then the open question mark is as to whether all important regional powers, including India, including European powers, and of course other relevant ones, will have to take either or decision uh, in the long term. So I will stop here and Thank then we you. can move uh, on. Thank you, Velina. Uh, Dan, you've been working on uh, the whole concept of creating value-based partnerships around the world. IRI has done stelling, uh, stellar work. You yourself have been working with democracies around the world. We have liberally used uh, rules-based order, value-based partnerships, democratic communities as our mantra. Uh, how many takers do you think exist for this kind of a proposition in the Indo-Pacific today, especially after what happened in Afghanistan and in recent days, including the vaccine question that uh, our, our previous speaker from Kenya spoke about? Uh, Samir, thank you. It's such a pleasure to be here with you and Atul, both old friends, and with Felina, whose institute we work with. And uh, we're very proud of our partnership with the BLED Strategic Forum. So congratulations uh, all around. Um, that's a lot of questions, Samir. I'll be very brief. You know, the argument for, uh, I think, a values-based diplomacy and a values-based vision in the Indo-Pacific is not meant to be exclusive. It's not meant to, you know, produce some kind of new Cold War. The idea, frankly, is a very practical one, which is that democracies enjoy a higher quality of engagement and partnership and alliance with each other. And it goes back to something uh, Foreign Minister, Minister of External Affairs Jai Shankar said in the previous segment which is that there's just a qualitatively different matter of trust mm -hmm. when groups like the Quad sit down, groups like NATO uh, sit down. It's different, right? So let's be mindful of that when it comes to vaccines, when it comes to pandemic response, when it comes to working on climate and energy matters, when it comes to dealing with violent extremism and terrorism. Uh, our closest allies and partners are democracies. That's as true of India as it is true for Europe, as it is true for the United States. That doesn't mean we're not going to be very pragmatic. It doesn't mean we're not going to work with everyone uh, whenever we can. Uh, but in fact, uh, I think the proposition here is that there is a contest underway in the world. And there is a rising authoritarian superpower with a very malign vision that is a threat to all free societies. Uh, and that fundamentally is of central concern to free and open societies who want to sustain a free and open world. So the term I prefer, Samir, is a free and open world. I think we can all agree on that, which of course is rules-based, which of course uh, leans in a liberal direction. With regard to Afghanistan, uh, you know, this has been gut-wrenching for all of us uh, who have worked on this issue uh, for the past few decades. Uh, 
Uh, I, I will say uh, there was some schadenfreude in Russia and China in particular, but then there was sort of an, a more immediate recognition that, wait, maybe we should take the President of the United States seriously. He says he wants to free up resources and energy and bandwidth to run an effective strategic competition. Mm -hmm. The President of the United States believes that the central contest in the world today is one between free and open societies and malign authoritarian revisionist powers. And that should actually be of concern to China and Russia and other uh, competitors. It shouldn't be something that they are celebrating. I do think we have an obligation to Afghan friends and partners. We left behind. I personally thought the withdrawal was a mistake. Uh, we know that jihadists and social extremists are celebrating around the world that this is actually empowering the very malevolent actors who pose a very real danger to free and open societies in Europe, in India, in the United States. So we're not going to hear the end of this. I'm afraid we're just looking at the beginning of another chapter, but you know, last thing, Samir, the U.S.-India counterterrorism partnership has grown in leaps and bounds. Uh, the U.S.-Europe uh, partnership, obviously through NATO, uh, is so strong in CT and other areas. And it's just a reminder that we have common challenges and that the greatest dangers to our free and open societies are posed by uh, autocracies, failed states, uh, violent extremists. That, that let me ask you a second question before I turn to Ambassador Keshe. Uh, and I asked this to our European colleagues in the previous panel. Uh, how divided are we as democracies at home? How divisive is our internal politics? And is it really making us take ineffective decisions? Are we crippled by our uh, very loud and vibrant public sphere? You know, Samir, I'd be very interested in your answer to that question as regards India. I mean, it's a question for all of us. Uh, and by the way, it's not as if we all lived in blissful political harmony until a few years ago, and suddenly polarization and political divisiveness emerged. In fact, uh, we've always had uh, somewhat polarized and divisive and messy politics. Frankly, that's what democracy is partly about. Uh, that it's all out there in the open. There are strongly held views. There is a pluralism of opinion and views on any given issue. And the purpose of democratic institutions is to mediate those views, right? And produce compromise. The question I think that you're really getting at is sort of, is this undermining our strategic competitiveness? Mm -hmm. And I do think that's a concern, which is why forums like this are so important. Groups like NATO and the Quad and other, uh, other settings are so important. is to remind us that actually uh, as democratic allies, we have very much in common, and we have uh, a core proposition, which is that fundamentally our open societies are a, a source of strength. They are a source of competitiveness. They are a driving, leading edge of innovation, of the fact that people around the world want to live in our open societies. They're not all flocking to China and Russia and other closed uh, societies, right? So let's remember that uh, our openness is a source of strength. Our pluralism is actually a source of strength. And let's work a little more domestically to create maybe a new foreign policy consensus around what we need to do that, frankly, rises above uh, party and self-interest. Uh, uh, thank you, Daniel. Uh, uh, Ambassador Keshe, uh, you heard in the previous segment uh, 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 from, in fact, uh, Dr. Jay Shankar, as well as uh, uh, Minister from Portugal and, and the Secretary from Kenya, uh, suggest that at the end of the day, the coalitions or partnerships or groupings will be measured by what they deliver. Uh, do you, uh, because you have a ring ringside view of the Indo-Pacific, both when you were in DC and now you're, you are in the Indian Ocean uh, sitting in uh, India, do you believe that Quad has what it takes to deliver on questions of development, health, security, supply chains, growth and economy? Or are we necessarily only a high profile uh, naval exercise? <laughs> Great question, Samir. Uh, first of all, let me go back to what Dan said about free and open societies. Whatever you may, uh, however you may define the Quad, I define them as the United States, India, Australia, Japan. And look at what they've already achieved. Think about the vaccines. You know, the U.S. was first to uh, the world with all of the most effective vaccines. India has come in so strongly with other vaccines. India is, I think, producing as many as a quarter billion vaccines a month. And when I talk to American and Indian leaders, they always say the same things. They say, we're going to vaccinate ourselves and we're going to vaccinate the entire world. It is a bold, it is a brave, it is a positive, 
it is an uplifting vision of, of how our quad democracies will take the world forward and how they will address the essential problems uh, in the world. I think our nations of powerful democratic innovation are going to power the global economy forward and out of the pandemic economic crisis. They're certainly working already very effectively and at full steam on trying to help ease the health problems around the world, uh, given the substantial donations of vaccine by both the United States and India. I do think that when our democracies work together, it's not just our governments or our babus or our politicians, it's our people. And the American people have proven that they are good at innovation. Certainly sitting here in India, I see boundless imagination and innovation every single day. And I have the highest respect for our Australian and Japanese uh, allies and partners. And so I think the Quad is absolutely an engine for positive outcomes. Uh, these are uh, four very like-minded democracies with an extremely high level of trust and respect for each other. And they have a, a, an ambitious vision that what's good for them is good for the entire world. And that, uh, I think, is truly positive. And uh, we don't want to, uh, as Melina so, uh, so eloquently said, we don't have this dark vision of, you know, geopolitics and, you know, sort of bringing people down and creating all sorts of, you know, new complications. Ours is a desire to see a world of happy, prosperous, healthy, uh, free people. And so that is something I can get behind. And I have a lot of faith in uh, uh, the innovation power of democracies. Over. Uh, thank you, Ambassador. Valina, let me turn to you for the last question of uh, this uh, particular segment. Uh, you heard your ministers from Europe speak about um, the internal conflicts. Let me ask you, and, and since you're an academic, you're going to be more direct. Let me ask you a slightly blunt question. Uh, does EU have it in them to create a consensus on taking tough political decisions? Or do you think the 16 plus 1 is challenging the uh, EU 27 already? So I will be very direct, uh, as usual, uh, and I would uh, actually describe this year when it comes to the relations of the European Union with the Indo-Pacific, and specifically with India, as probably one of the best years uh, as seen in a context of the last uh, two decades of uh, development. So if you take into consideration the huge success derived from the European Union India summit, the relaunch of negotiations on a F, uh, free trade uh, agreement, and free trade and much higher European Union as we that on hold, uh, the European Union, together with the US, have recognized the need to be a security actor in the Indo Pacific. Mm -hmm. So, what I'm expecting is that at some point, there will be probably a direct uh, route to the Quad and joining. Uh, I think we lost Valina there, but uh, perhaps. Uh, I think her essence the was... Interruption. Sorry for the short interruption. That was my connection. I suppose okay. That, uh, go ahead, go ahead. Is, is Valina here? Process with it. So, Valina, we, yes. we are struggling with your connection. We can't hear you at all. But uh, let me try and complete your response on your behalf without knowing what you wanted to say. Uh, uh, oh, oh, you're back with us. Go ahead. You're back with us. Yes, sorry. Technique and pandemic of course you never know you never know when it will work and never uh, and and when it will not work so my point is that of course on the one side it's a slow process slow decision making process within the european union and uh, the european powers on the other side we have strong signals when it comes to the indo pacific region and this is the region where geopolitics and geoeconomics meet. So that means that I'm expecting stronger actions, uh, much more to happen at the level of bilateral and multilateral relations. I'm expecting the European Union and uh, the European powers to be more active and to contribute even to quad drills at some point or quad uh, negotiations, if you like. And finally, the reconfiguration of supply chains is a moment 
uh, a great moment also for the European Union and the Indo-Pacific countries. And we should actually capitalize on this moment. That means reconfiguring supply chains away from China, moving them more towards uh, India and other Indo-Pacific nations. And of course, there, once again, there is a great role to be played by Brussels and uh, the European powers. So thank you so much, Valina. I think uh, I uh, take away three strong messages from uh, this particular conversation. The first, I think, uh, Ambassador Atul Keshav is, uh, um, is the brand ambassador for the Quad Grouping, and he is extremely uh, confident that it is a, a group that is going to deliver. It is going to be a force for good, and it is already beginning uh, to contribute uh, to the region and to global developments. Um, the, uh, Daniel was quite clear that democracy matters, and democratic societies, irrespective of the debates we see on television and social media, are going to uh, lead to outcomes that are positive and that are, necessary, and, and that are going to create uh, benefits for people and communities and societies across the world. And Velina gives us the reassurance that the EU is in the game. Uh, it has a, a strong uh, momentum to uh, be a political actor in one of the most um, um, complex uh, geographies of the world, the Indo-Pacific. And uh, hopefully, um, uh, EU will start contributing uh, politically to the stability of that region as well. Thank you so much, all three of you, for joining us at the Blood Forum. And it's a pleasure to host you uh, for this particular event. Thank you so much. Sorry? May I ask something? Oh, yeah, there's a question for you, actually. Uh, but uh, the organizers, can I take a question? OK. One question. Go ahead. I'm Dimitri Zeri from Port of Copper in Slovenia, and I recently... Wait a second, I need to hear it. Okay. Sorry. I'm Dimitri Zadeb from Port of Copper in Slovenia, and I recently read somewhere that there will be some military maneuvers uh, jointly between uh, Russia and China in, in the Pacific area. Is this is somehow true? Either this is having some impact on this uh, process? And Mr. Keshav, do you want to respond to that? This was you, published in some newspapers. You have to unmute yourself, yeah. Yeah, no, I've, uh, thank you very much. Look, um, uh, excellent panel, Samir, by the way. Really enjoyed the interventions with my colleagues. I feel like I'm the dumb, uh, the dumb one here. But uh, let me just say that, look, nations have a right to engage in peaceful and lawful activities on the high seas. We believe in that. It's a fundamental bedrock principle. What we also believe in is rule of law, and we believe that there ought to be a rules-based international order, and that, you know, larger countries shouldn't be, you know, imposing their will in some ways. Mm -hmm. So back um, in uh, 2020, uh, the United States filed a letter uh, with the uh, UN Secretary General, and I think about a dozen other countries have also filed similar letters uh, with the United Nations uh, that essentially call into question assertions made by China, for instance, uh, with regard to their claims uh, in the South China Sea, and uh, you know, also explain our and emphasize our support for international law. So when it comes to peaceful activities on the high seas that are lawful, uh, I think you'll get no objection for the United States. When it veers into unlawful claims and unlawful activities, mm -hmm. then you're going to end up with uh, letters like these deposited with the United Nations, and we certainly encourage other countries, if they feel the same, to deposit similar letters. Uh, I think uh, easily a dozen or more have spoken up about these concerns. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, and thank you for being a sport and taking a question from uh, the audience. Uh, and uh, please join me in applauding their interventions, and thank you once again. Thank you.
Da 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 da. Yeah.